We're here. Okay. Praise the Lord. Let's um go ahead and get the, your Bibles out. <clears throat> Some short, shorter verses today that um I might just read. But um I was thinking, can you hear me by the way? Does this need to be on or anything? We're good. I'll put it on. Put it on? Yeah. Okay. Ah. All right. <clears throat> All right. So um I was thinking about um uh this concept, which is if everyone in the fellowship was exactly like you, what would that look like? If it was like me, it would look pretty good, you know, <laughs> handsome. And, um, but I'm not talking about looks, really. I'm talking about behavior, behavior, what you do. If everyone did what you did, what would that look like as far as fellowship, as far as <clears throat> revival and all those things? Um, you know, would there be a second meeting? Would there be a first meeting? Would there be revival? Would there be fellowship? Would there be any of these things? Uh, if everyone did what you did, are you an example? Uh, the Bible talks about being an example uh, to uh, to one another, uh, a testimony. And uh, and to make these things our responsibilities, to make revival our responsibility, to make <clears throat> um, yeah. the help of your brothers and sisters through fellowship, through encouragement of the word, through all kinds of things, through uh, natural, tangible support, through all kinds of things, to make them our responsibility. <clears throat> In the Old Testament, um, Cain and Abel, and um, uh, they had uh, <clears throat> a, a, a disagreement, I suppose, and Cain uh, killed Abel. And it was asked, um, you know, where's your brother? And he said, am I my brother's keeper? And... Uh, he was thinking it was a rhetorical question that the answer was no, but the answer is, is actually yes. Um, and so these are the things that we do. These are the things that are called our responsibility, our vocation or our job. In school, sometimes the teacher will put you together in group projects. Ever, anyone ever been in a group project? Yeah. Um, in a group project, there tends to be maybe a few people who are doing the project and a few people who aren't really doing the project. <laughs> In a group project, there tends to be, well, I'm not good at writing, so I'll let you write. In a group project, there might be, well, I'm not good at the research, so you do the research. In a group project, there might be, well, I'm not good at the, the presenting to the class, so you go ahead and present to the class. And you find that maybe uh, a few of those didn't really participate in the project, although they they were part of uh, part of the group. We've all experienced that, and we know that the uh, the the teacher's idea for the group project is that everybody uh, pitches in and that they work together and and so forth. Uh, I want to turn to the Old Testament now in Nehemiah. Nehemiah is a story we've um, heard a few times and we've read our, our, on our own, I'm sure, and we've <clears throat> um, heard it brought out in talks. Um, so I won't go over the whole story, but just for a little context, <clears throat> um, the, uh, the, the city um, of the Jews was broken down. And uh, and destroyed. The walls were down. And I want to go to uh, Nehemiah 4, verse 6. It talks about them building the wall back up. Um, Nehemiah 4, verse 6. So built we the wall, and all the wall was joined together, 
unto the half thereof, for the people had a mind to work. They're saying the job got accomplished because the people were united and together and all worked and they had a mind to work. And I think that's very important about the mind to work. They had a mind to work. Their mind was set on uh, something that they declared their responsibility, the rebuilding of the wall, the rebuilding of the city as God would want. And they had that on the forefront of their mind as a goal and would not be shaken from the goal, no matter what. This guy had to travel very far from his comfy position in the king's court, <laughs> travel very far, you know, leaving all his comforts behind into a hostile territory where he was not going to be welcome. Uh, and he wasn't welcome and he was threatened those that went with him were all threatened over and over again they were told their work is useless and so on but they had a mind to work they were so determined to build that wall and to build that city that they didn't stop um and skip down to verse 17 there's another part of that story that i wanted to read out in verse 17 they which buildeth on the wall and they that bear burdens with those that laid it, everyone with one uh, with one of his hands wrought in the work, and with the other hand held a weapon. <clears throat> they were they were doing this work expecting problems to come. They were doing this work knowing that they had been threatened, but they didn't say. Well, because I have difficulty, I'm not going to do this right now. And they didn't say, because I have, uh, I don't have the, the support of the local government or the local people, then we're going to hold off on doing this. We're not going to do this right now. Instead, they, they went forth with their work, knowing that they might have to fight for it, to even be able to do their work. And they were ready to do that. Um, working in one hand or uh, a weapon in the other hand. In verse 18, it says, For the builders, everyone had his sword girded by his side, and so builded. And he that sounded the, the trumpet was by me. And it goes on, it talks about what their plan was. If, if one part of the wall was attacked, then they would all go over there. But they were ready. They were prepared. They were determined to serve the Lord. And uh, they had made up their mind. Nothing was going to stop them from doing this work. Um, so we glean a lot from the Old Testament stories, and we 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 use that um, to learn about the character of God, or even the character of His people that served Him, and what pleased God and what didn't. <clears throat> uh, and uh, this was a thing that was certainly pleasing to the Lord. Uh, to to be this way, to be on fire in this way, to be determined in this way, to be ready to fight against anything else that would stand in your way, like uh, like these folks were. Let's go um, to the New Testament, if you would. New Testament in Luke, the Gospel of Luke, and we'll be in verse uh, twenty six. So Luke 14, sorry, I don't know if I said that, chapter 14, verse 26. It says here, if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. We all have a life that we go to work maybe or maybe you work from home or maybe <laughs> maybe you go to school and catch the bus whatever it is that you do you have a life and you have brothers and, and sisters maybe and family and friends and all kinds of things going on and sometimes you have obligations to them you have um to provide perhaps to care for to support 
to love them. Um, and of course we do that. We don't, um, the word hate here is not to actually hate. And we heard that in a talk too recently that this is just talking about these other things in your life, even your own life. They just can't be priority number one. And it's saying here, if anything else is priority number one, even your own life or your own family or anything like that, then you cannot be my disciple. It's very clear. Let's get down to verse 33. So likewise, whosoever... Is, is, this, is this a typo from my things? So whosoever he be of you. No, nah, I guess that's okay. Whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. So first talks about people and yourself and then talks about maybe your stuff and the things that you care for. <clears throat> and again here, forsake. It's not saying you have to sell all your stuff. It's not saying you have to give everything away, but this again means these other things cannot be priority number one. They can't get in the way. In fact, the Bible even talks about if something's getting in your way of serving the Lord, of building that wall, of rebuilding that city, of doing our work in the Lord, then it needs to be cast out. It talks about if your arm gives you trouble with serving the Lord, then you're better off cutting it off. We would think, oh, well, that's just crazy. We're just going to skip by. <laughs> We're going to ignore that. Well, nobody's cutting off any arms around here. But that's how serious the Lord is about it. If your arm is preventing you in any way, it's better if you just cut it off. If your eye is preventing you from serving me, says the Lord, it's better if you just pluck it out. Get rid of it. It's better to be able to enter into the kingdom of heaven without your eye, without your arm, than it is to keep them and not make it. Uh, verse 34, next verse. It says, seemingly randomly, salt is good. Sounds like someone's changing the subject. <laughs> when, I was in, uh, when I was in high school and someone would... If someone's tired of talking about one subject, they would go, so I like soda. Um, seems like the same here. Salt is good. But no, it's talking about salt as a useful thing. Like the Lord sees us as a useful thing. Something that preserves the earth. Preserves it. This world is still here because we're here. We're preserving the earth. And because those that are unsaved still need spoken to. We haven't spoken to them yet. So we're here. We're, we're salt. We're preserving this earth. But if the salt has lost its savor, you know, when something is savory, tastes, you know, salty, savory. If it can't do that, then, you know, what's the salt going to be seasoned with? It is the salt. Can't be seasoned with anything else. Um, if the salt doesn't taste salty, if it's not salty, or if it's not going to preserve anything, then it's useless to the Lord. And salt would be useless to us if it didn't taste like salt. In verse 35, it is neither fit for the land nor yet for the dunghill, talking about the salt. But men cast it out. He that has ears to hear, let him hear. So he's saying, if you heard me right, talking about this salt being useless. <clears throat> yes, that's what I said, says the Lord. <laughs> you heard me. Basically, if you had ears to hear, I kind of translate that in my own mind. You heard me. Right. Um, that uh, that usefulness of that salt is the comparison to us uh let's turn now uh to corinthians first corinthians six just a short verse there really we know that the lord 
didn't hold back anything for us. We know that Jesus himself did not hold back anything for us. We know he gave his life. We know he gave it in a way that was horrifying um, and not fit for God himself or fit for even a, a king or fit for anyone we would think is good, at, but the worst kind of death. He didn't hold back and he didn't hold back in giving us uh, what we need either and promises still to continue to give us what we need, mostly what we ask for, unless it's not good for us, but he'll do for us what is best all the time. <clears throat> and he holds nothing back. And um, that's an example to us. He wants us also to hold nothing back. Not for ourselves, not for anyone else, but to give all to him. Um, sometimes we think we are. Oh, I am. I do that. I go to the meeting. I, uh, you know, I go to some outreaches. I do this. I'm, I do everything that I can. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm in it. But also sometimes if you stop and you examine yourself, you will find that perhaps you've only done 80% of the job or even 90% of the job. And it's not enough. Um, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 12. All things are lawful unto me. So this is about us. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient or good for me or beneficial maybe for the work or for the job that I'm called to do. It's not that I'm not allowed to do these other things. I am. Or that I can never do these other things. I can. But just because you can, or you're allowed, or the Bible didn't say specifically not to, doesn't make it a good idea for you. Or for the work. For the body. <clears throat> um, so all things are lawful unto me. I'm free. I'm not in bondage anymore. I'm free to do as I please. But there are still things that are a good idea and things that are perhaps not a good idea and he continues all things are lawful for me but i will not be brought under the power of any even though it's lawful for me <clears throat> i'm not going to serve anything else i'm not going to put anything else first <clears throat> um go over now to chapter 10 if you would same thing really but expand it slightly first corinthians 10 verse 23 says again all things are lawful for me but all things are not expedient all things are lawful for me but all things edify not and that scripture makes me think of a very simple filter that I was uh, uh, given or told about that we put our thought process through a filter with, is this edifying? Is this good for the body? Is this serving the Lord or myself? Is this serving the Lord or someone else? We do serve other people as a form of serving the Lord, but we have to make sure that the Lord is first and they are second or third or whatever. We can't make our own rules to say, I'm going to serve the Lord in this other way because this other thing that I'm doing is good and perhaps a good testimony or whatever. When the Lord has specifically told you to do this, we can't trade it. We can't do something else. I know this is all sounding very vague, but I'm just <laughs> use your imagination. Um, 
<clears throat> they didn't have any more old uh, in, in this in these scriptures here. Any more Old Testament law to follow, but the choices that that they were making and the choices that we make still matter. <clears throat> um, yeah, and uh, to to call back to call back to uh, uh, I think one of uh, Pastor Steve's talks a while back. And he said, if you think coming to one meeting a week is enough, you are kidding yourself. Did I get the quote right? <laughs> that had an impact on Bruce. He's said that. I'm allowed to say that out loud, right? You've said that yourself. <clears throat> um, because it is, right? But this is expanded. It's not just a meeting. It's not anything. It's fully serving the Lord. It's having your mind on the things of the Lord as much as you can. I know, I know we're all natural people, but the the goal is on the things of the Lord always and acting on that always. And that can be so many different things besides meetings, but um, uh, we have to do it all. And our, and our goal has to be to do it all. <clears throat> So what is enough? What is enough? How do we know if, if we've done enough or doing enough? Um, firstly, we could we could say there's nothing that we could actually do as far as works that is enough. It's never enough because we are never perfect as Jesus was perfect. Uh, and we can't, you know, through works get ourselves in, into the kingdom. We know that. It's God that justifies. It's God that sees our hearts. Sometimes we can do something and we don't really want to. Sometimes we could do something, but we're doing it, even if it's a spiritual thing. Come to the meeting. Let's say for an example, come to the meeting. I'm coming to the meeting. And if the Lord sees in your heart that it's not for him, then it's useless. It's not salty. It has to be for him. If you're doing it because you want to make Pastor Steve happy, or you're doing it because, uh, you know, Sage gave you a hard time about it, or then it's then it's useless. It has to be for him. <clears throat> and when it's for him, when our attitude is for him, and our faith is in him, that that's the right choice. Our faith is in him. He's going to provide what we didn't do. He's going to provide and overcome anything that we're fearing about it. He's going to do it all. Our faith and our attitude is for him. <clears throat> um, he requires those things. Faith and the attitude together, also known as vision. A vision is what we call those things. And these two things, or this vision, controls our action. It controls our every action, here or when we leave here. Our attitude towards serving the Lord and wanting to serve him always. <clears throat> and our faith that he will come through. And our faith in him that he provides what's best. And our faith in his word to follow this process that he's given us are all of the utmost importance. Um, Romans 12 is just one scripture here. You can turn or not turn, but Romans 12 verse 1 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Saying this is not grievous, this is not something difficult, this is reasonable, this isn't too much to ask. This is reasonable that you uh, present your body as a living sacrifice, in other words, that you are 100%, that you are serving the Lord always, that you are putting every thought into captivity, as the scripture says, bring every thought into captivity putting it through this filter of does this edify does this serve 
And if it serves, who does it serve? What does it serve? And don't kid yourself because the Lord sees your heart. The Lord sees your heart. <clears throat> I've just, there's an Old Testament story that I've probably used too much, so I won't do it again, but I'll reference it, um, which is King Saul. King Saul was instructed to go into a nation and with his armies and wipe everything out. Everybody, everything, every animal. It's very clear, no question. We all know what King Saul did. He mostly did that. You know, he 95% did that. And the famous line from that, uh, from the prophet was, well, then what is this bleating in my ears? Why do I still hear some animals and stuff? And who's this guy? Oh, he's the king. We thought, you know, we'd save him. <laughs> what was Saul's attitude? It looked to him, to Saul, like he was serving the Lord, even on the back of his mind, he knew he wasn't. It probably looked to the people like Saul was serving the Lord because he did 95% of the job. But he wasn't. Um, it looks like, oh, 95%. I wish I had 95% on all my grades, you know, that's, that's a, okay, maybe an A plus. I don't know. Never really got there, <laughs> but 95%, whoo, you're doing great, man. Good job, but not according to the Lord. So when we talk to each other and we encourage each other and we uplift each other and we're saying good job on what you've done, good job on you know, serving the Lord in that way, encouraging each other. And we might see the, <clears throat> the good parts and we encourage each other with the good parts, but it's up to you to examine yourself and say, was that a hundred percent? Am I doing a hundred percent? Another thing that Saul Saul, King Saul that he didn't do. Another thing is, take responsibility for his actions. When he was found out, when he was called out, when he, when, when the prophet said, Saul, you are not doing what I said. You did not do what God, what the Lord God said. What did he do? He said, well, I kind of did. I pretty much did, but I thought, you know, he thought it was better. Maybe for testimony's sake, maybe for taking care of his own people and his and his soldiers and his maybe his family. He thought, I'll keep some of these sheep. I'll keep some of these things and we'll keep the king alive because maybe that'll be useful. Maybe keeping the king alive, he'll give me some answers and he'll give me some angle or something to leverage so I can, you know, further my own, you know, natural kingdom or I don't know what he was thinking. I don't know what he really saved them for, but what he said he saved them for was for the Lord. What he said he did it for was so that, you know, um, we're going to sacrifice these to you, Lord. And what did he say? What did the Lord say back? What did the prophet say back? To obey is better than sacrifice. To obey is better than sacrifice. <clears throat> Um, he didn't take responsibility for his actions. He had no repentance about doing part of the job. He had no repentance at all. Uh, and he tried to justify his actions with natural thinking. Natural thinking. It's difficult to encourage each other sometimes. <clears throat> And say what needs to be said sometimes. Because we could see that 95% maybe in, in each other. We could see that according to the world, according to our natural minds, just like Saul, what you've done is great. What you've done is serving. What you've done is far beyond what anyone else would have ever done. 
But if it's not 100%, there's still work to do. And I say all this knowing that we all know we will never actually be perfect uh, as long as we're breathing. <clears throat> but that's the effort. That is the heart. That is the attitude. That is the goal to get there. Um, okay, doing great on time. Um, more short ones. Uh, well, First Thessalonians 5, verse 2, one verse. It says, for you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. These things I'm talking about being 100%, examining yourself, correcting the course, they are urgent matters. It's not eventually, it's not once this happens or once that happens or once I get more of this or once I get paid more or once my job gives me more freedom or once I'm done with school or once nothing. It is uh, now. The, the day of, uh, of salvation is now and the Lord can come back now. <clears throat> um, as a thief in the night. Another story, not sure if I'll read them all out, but um, in Matthew 25, is a, in the first few verses, is a story of the, of the virgins, the parable of the virgins. And, well, I guess let's just go there. <clears throat> That's uh, Matthew 25, please. Okay. So just um, real quick for some context. Um, let's go verse two. And five of them were wise and five of them were foolish. So we got 50% here. Um, they that were, were foolish uh, took their lamps with no oil. So 10 of these people they all had the same goal. They all had the same mission. But uh, half of them didn't prepare themselves half of them had i guess what you could what you could derive as a, as a bad attitude they were lazy about it they thought maybe the 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 wedding was going to be delayed a little bit or maybe they thought maybe they thought the group since they were in a group project of 10 that the other five were going to carry them over maybe they thought the other five were going to give them the oil that they needed <laughs> But they didn't. So we can um, in verse eight, and the foolish said unto why to the wise, "Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out." In verse nine, but the wise answered, saying, "Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go to them that sell and buy for for yourselves." And of course, verse ten, when they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went with him, and the marriage door was shut. That's it. No more chances. And afterward, verse 11, came the other virgins, the foolish ones, saying, Lord, open to us. And he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. I know you not. Uh, and I think this is a scary thing. There... Ten foolish virgins thought they were with the group and they are, you know, benefiting from being with the group and they are um, relying on them and not preparing themselves. <laughs> and so they weren't ready and there won't be another chance. Matthew, uh, stay in, in, in verse 25, <clears throat> skip down to uh, verse 14, and, and um, another parable begins. And this is a parable of the, of the talents. We won't read through this entire thing either. But it's a similar situation. We have 
three different people that were given talents here it's money uh by their master and the the idea was they were freely given this thing and they have a master so the idea is they're supposed to work for the master they're supposed to do something and one of them didn't do anything well he thought he did something he thought i know i'll just keep it safe i'll just be very careful with this thing that he so that when he comes back i'll give it back to him well he doesn't want to come back and get the same thing back he wants to come back and get more back but this guy wasn't ready <laughs> um let me skip down it says thou oughtest therefore verse 27 sorry Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. You know, more than what I gave you. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it to him which hath ten talents. <clears throat> For unto every one that, that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. That doesn't sound fair, but the concept is God is about all or nothing. He's not about partials. He's not about 50%. He's not about 80%. <clears throat> He's about going all in. He's about putting all your eggs in one basket. We're running out of time now. <clears throat> Let's go to... Let's go back to First Corinthians, and I'll just mention a few other things along the way. Um, First Corinthians ten. While you're turning there, um, First Peter says, "Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour." Says, be sober, be vigilant. In other words, be ready. Examine yourself. Course correct yourself. Always, and uh, and line it up with the with the word of God. But be sober means be aware, be awake, pay attention. Be vigilant means stay on it. Keep working. Keep trying. Keep making an effort towards towards those goals. Because your adversary, the devil, is walking around like a roaring lion, wants to take you down, but really, it's yourself taking you down. Nine times out of ten, well, nine, ten times out of ten, it's yourself. Because it's all about your attitude. <clears throat> no one else can take you can can take you away from the Lord. No, no, uh, no, anything can take you away. It's your choice, and it's your choice to be. 100% or 95% or 50% is your choice. <clears throat> and God chooses those who are ready. Um, we, we're not turning to this because it's another one I use all the time, I guess. But uh, Judges 7 is a story of Gideon and the armies. Gideon was to fight a battle. He had, you know, forget all the numbers now a lot <laughs> of soldiers and the lord chose only the soldiers that were ready he sent home everybody that was afraid first of all and then he told them all to go down to the water and some of them were going to drink the water in one way and some of them were going to drink the water in another way and in one of these ways drinking the water it showed that they were ready they were sober, they were vigilant because they were paying attention and they were looking around and they didn't focus on indulging themselves, I guess. <clears throat> um, God chooses those who are ready. And that'll be few, just like in Gideon, it'll be few. Um, if you're in First Corinthians, <clears throat> chapter 10. 
This is the answer to I can't. It's not really a question, <laughs> but I can't. This is the answer. Well, a couple things I'll read is the answer. This is one of them. First Corinthians 10, verse 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. You say, I, I can't. And, and you're saying that in response to something that has to do with serving the Lord. This is the answer or one of the answers. The Lord saying, what do you mean you can't? Of course you can. You're spirit filled. You have my power in you. I will give you strength. I will give you wisdom. I will rearrange the world and hold the sun in the sky for you. You can do it, not in your own strength, but you can do it. So I can't, when it comes to serving the Lord, doesn't exist. The Lord does not accept that. Uh, another one, um, very short, uh, Philippians 4 verse 3 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We know this. We know these scriptures. We've memorized these scriptures. So for us to ever say, I can't. Or, why would we ever say? Um, Romans 8. With my last few minutes, got to throw in Romans 8, right? Um, used to be a thing. I don't know so, so much of a thing now. It used to be writing a talk. Get Romans 8 in there. <laughs> Just has a lot of good stuff to say for us spirit-filled people. I want to go all the way to the very end instead of 828, which is where most a lot of people's favorite scriptures are. We're going to go 38, Romans 38, Romans 8, 38. For I am persuaded, I'm fully convinced that neither death nor life nor angels. I just want to pause there for a second. I would like this experience. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. If you are, let's say, uh, on your way to uh, a meeting or something like that, and an angel, it was obvious to you somehow, I don't know how it would be, but there was an angel, said, stop, don't go to the meeting, do not serve the Lord today, just go home and mind your business, or go home and do something else, or whatever, do not serve the Lord today. We would say, no, you're not going to stop me from serving the Lord today. An angel is nothing compared to me and what I will become by serving the Lord. They are lower level servants, <laughs> uh, especially if they're going to do something like that, right? <laughs> um, nothing will stop us. It says e even in death, right? Because we'll, we will go on. Um, not, not angels, not principalities, maybe government, maybe whatever. Nothing's going to stop us. No powers, so just anything, right? Any power, things that are happening now or anything that will ever happen in the future. Height, depth, I think they're just trying to cover everything here, all bases, right? Nor any other creature, you know, like a a lion or a bear in King's in King uh, David's case, or um, before he was king, or Goliath, or anything, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And the love of God is not just some airy, non tangible concept. The love of God is specified and defined. In the word, if you love me, keep my commandments. What's going to stop you from keeping his commandments? Well, we just read nothing, nothing at all. What are the commandments? Well, we don't have time for that. There are many. We know what they are. <clears throat> and if we don't, 
we read what they are we and we pray about what they are um and that's our that's our goal um and matthew 6 it says for where your treasure is there will, you, will your heart be also whatever you think is the most important thing that's what you're gonna do if you think serving the lord and every little thing that that involves is the most important thing that is what you will do if you're just doing that for appearances and something else is actually on your heart and something else is more important and something else comes first the lord doesn't accept that um nothing can can stop us uh from serving the lord so are you this example are you this 100 percent? is your goal for this to be 100 percent? are you able to give 100 percent? yes yes and yes praise the lord i'll leave it there okay uh